What first motivated you to get into computer science? I was a math major at the UCLA. And uh, in my junior year, one of the math classes was canceled and I needed to find something that would fit that slot. And so I saw a computer class. And so I thought I'd take it. At that time, there was no computer science undergraduate major. major. I'd certainly known about computers, but nobody thought it was an important thing to do. I just kind of took it to fill, fill a time slot. And even though it was kind of prehistoric technology by today's standards, uh, we the programs were punched in cards and you got paper output. But nevertheless, it still had, it's kind of like an old video game. And you still had that possibility of seeing the excitement of your ideas coming alive inside the computer. And I was hooked. And then for the rest of my career, I took classes in the College of Engineering or then the business school, as many computer science classes as I could take. Um, and then, uh, and that's what got me into it. Very cool. Could you explain your work on reduced instruction set computer and its impact on the microprocessor industry and modern computing? Okay, I'll explain what it is and then we'll talk about the impact. So when hardware talks to software, it has a vocabulary. And that vocabulary, the technical name of that vocabulary is an instruction set. So one of the questions that happened when microprocessors became popular is what should the instruction set look like? What should the vocabulary be? And there were two versions of it. One version is uh, you'd have these very rich instructions, very powerful instructions. You can think of a polysyllabic instructions. And the idea was if you use these very sophisticated instructions, it shouldn't take as many to for your program. The alternative school, which uh, John Hennessy and I worked on, was have very simple instructions. So monosyllabic, monosyllabic words, you could think of it. And it, it would probably take more of the simple instructions, but you might be able to read them faster. So that was kind of the question about reduced vocabulary, reduced instruction set, uh, or a, a complex instruction set, as we called it. And it turned out, after several years of work, that uh, you would have to read, say, 25% more instructions if you use the simple ones, the reduced ones. But they ran five times faster. So the net effect was a lot of factor of three or four times faster. So that's what the reduced instruction set was about, the simplified vocabulary. And then the consequences were eventually, um, there's a company that's called ARM, a very popular company. And the R in ARM stands for risk. And so now risk processors are 99% of all the processors shipped in the world today. There are still, you know, the some of the laptops you buy still have the complex instruction set and the, some of the servers still have this complex instruction set but almost everything else uses risk technology and what are some of the biggest challenges we face in computing today well there's as, as you read the news there's all this excitement about artificial intelligence so on a technical challenge is with the slowing down of moore's law how do we deliver the tremendous demand and compute power that people need to explore this, the potential of AI. So in the heyday of Moore's law, like 10, 10 or 20 years ago, things were doubling every 18 months. That's what we need today, but Moore's law is slowing down. So now we need to innovate in kind of the things that I do in terms of the design of computers, as well as innovate in the software above it to figure out how can we do this more efficiently because it's it's I, I think of what's going on now is kind of like uh, I think of like space travel right like we got this first exploration of these large language models we get to the moon and it's, oh my god look what it can do it's really exciting and so now we go to Mars and they can do even more things and so now they're gearing up to go to Jupiter assuming if we deploy a tremendous amount of hardware there'll be tremendous things that we can discover so it's a very exciting time It's not quite clear why it works so well. It's not quite clear if we keep building bigger systems, will they keep getting smarter? But that's what we're trying to figure out how to do today at the same time when Moore's Law is, is, is failing us. So that's a big challenge. And a challenge that I'm interested in personally is besides how do we build hardware that will explore AI, is worrying about our carbon footprint of, of computing. I've done some papers in this area and there was some alarming papers that, around what they thought the, the cost of machine learning of just running the hardware. Those turned out to be 
inflated by a factor of 100,000. And so, uh, so I don't think the actual, you know, running of the machine learning is going to be significant in, in given everything else is going on. But I think in computing the the embodied cost of manufacturing computers, I think is something we need to take a look at. So in 2021, we made 1.7 billion cell phones. I mean, there's only 7 billion people on the planet. So I mean, we're probably throwing away a billion cell phones a year. So I think we should be, you know, the, the ML stuff while it's running, you know, is is we can, we should make that better. But the big challenge is what should we do about reducing the embodied costs of manufacturing computing. How do you envision the evolution of computing in the future and what improvements can be made? Well, for those of us who design hardware with the ending of Moore's law, what we expect is to uh, that a data center would be filled with different types of computers for different types of problems. So it'd be much more heterogeneous. Uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the whole data centers in the cloud were all standard processors and it's, it just stamped them out and that made it very easy for software like i said with the failing of moore's law we can't get that tremendous performance anymore so now we'll need special processors for each type of application and that's going to make it more challenging for the software stack to be able to do that but that's what i i think it's going to look like and what do you consider important in computer science education and what can we do to advance that field Um, boy, that's a big question. We're right in, one of the problems is just accessibility to the information. Certainly Berkeley and like many campuses around the world were crushed by the popularity of computer science. Uh, when I, when I got involved, it was a rare topic and kind of nerdy people were in it. So kind of people didn't want to be called computer science majors. Somehow computer science became cool. And uh, a large fraction of the campus wanted to major it much more. And campuses aren't very reactive. It's not like companies where you just hire a bunch of people. Campuses are slow moving devices. So how do we have high quality people who know what they're talking about, giving high quality education to meet the demand of everybody who wants to learn it? I think um, this is one of these tipping points. Uh, it's been over my career, there have been several major innovations that have really ch changed the information technology world and often society. So the invention of the microprocessor was one of those. The The internet was one of those. Uh, probably smartphones with the iPhone was one of those things that, you know, uh, uh, changed all kinds of things. Um, this, the AI is one of those. And people, we don't quite, you know, the, the chat box amazingly, uh, uh, ChatGPT is only 12 months old, which is kind of remarkable given how much uh, focus it has in our society. We had here in California, we had a strike. And one of the major issues for the actors was uh, how is AI and, and the writers is how is AI going to affect their jobs? That That's not something two years ago, I think they would have even, even thought about. So that's, you know, people are worried about the impact of jobs and all, all of those kinds of issues. I would say, uh, back when uh, the personal computer came out, which is probably another one of those tipping points, I thought we needed a, a program on campus at Berkeley, and not so much for the engineers and scientists, but for the people in humanities to learn how to use it. So I created a course that uh, that was aimed for the humanities to learn about how to use computing. I think we probably need something like that today for large language models. Is uh, what what can they do? What are they bad at? How do you take advantage of them? How do you put them to work? I think there would be a demand for, um, a lot of people would love to know how to use that effectively, how it would change your jobs, how you would use that. So I think, you know, how, the general interest in computer science, and then how does one learn how to interact and be effective at large language models, which are probably going to get even more powerful in the next few years. 